For those of you who are new to Book at Lunchtime, uh, this is one of Torch's longer standing flagship events. Uh, we've been going at Book at Lunchtime since 2013, so 10 years, in other words, since the inception of Torch. Every single one of the Book at Lunchtime events is filmed and they're available on our Torch website on the YouTube channel if you want to go and see ones in the past. Um, we have, in other words, a growing history and a really strong heritage. We are also celebrating Torch at 10, 10 years of Torch this year, and this event is part of that celebration. Today, as I say, we're delighted to welcome Professor Catherine Sutherland um, from the English faculty here at Oxford to discuss this wonderful book. Um, as regulars to Book at Lunchtime will know, I usually live in the 16th century, so the question that manuscripts might matter is my bread and butter. The interesting thing about this book is it asks, why do modern manuscripts matter? And the way it asks that question is to explore politics, commerce, aesthetics of heritage, and also a whole series of other related questions. I don't want to um, take too much time uh, or even prejudge where the discussion is going to go. But this is a really, really exciting and a really rich look at a whole range of questions. Um, I will just quote one little bit from uh, the blurb, which may come up again later in discussion. Poised on the boundary, where precious treasure becomes ab abject waste, litter and mess, modern literary manuscripts hover between riches and rubbish. It's a really nice way of putting it. And again, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, it's beautifully written. As a trailer for forthcoming productions from Catherine, she's currently working on two further fascinating projects, a short study of one specific author's working manuscript as a way of telling various human stories. We're not going to find out who that is, although we might in due course. This sets the manuscript within an environment in which people and things exchange properties. The other is in the earlier stages of planning. It's a study of mid-20th century women writers. To enable us all to understand more about the role of modern manuscripts, Catherine is joined today by two panelists who will be adding their expertise to the discussion. We welcome Professor Fiona Stafford from Somerville College, who's also a paid-up torch member insofar as she heads up the Environmental Humanities Network that we have, and also Professor Seamus Perry from uh, Balliol College. It's my great pleasure then to hand over to Fiona, who's our chair for the proceedings today, if there are questions after they've spoken, I'll be wandering around with this roving mic. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you very much, Wes. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming um, to, to join us in celebrating what is, as well said, an absolutely wonderful book. Um, it falls on me as the chair to introduce um, our author, uh, Catherine Sutherland, uh, who until recently was Professor of Bibliography uh, in Oxford. She's now a Senior Research Fellow uh, at St Anne's College, and she is a, a, a world-leading scholar on, on Jane Austen. Um, one of her uh, probably best-known books is a wonderful book, Jane Austen's Textual Lives, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, she's also responsible for the kind of Herculean effort of um, digitizing uh, Jane Austen's fiction, fiction manuscripts, uh, amazing website. If you're seriously interested in, in Austen, I do recommend it very much. Um, but she also has a very wide um, experience as a, an editor herself. She's edited Mansfield Park um, and she's uh, edited lots of other people as well, like uh, Walter Scott. Um, so she's extraordinarily learned scholar who I admire hugely. Um, but also, um, she Wes has always already mentioned how beautifully the book is written and there is a kind of liveliness of style um, that characterizes Catherine's work. So there is nothing forbiddingly learned at all about it. It's a, it's a very entertaining read, uh, as, as we'll see. And she has a really kind of strong sense of the contemporary. Uh, so that, that question, uh, why modern manuscripts matter, is something that comes across with, with great sort of liveliness and force. Um, and our other panellist um, is Seamus Perry, very distinguished romanticist, well known uh, for his work on Coleridge especially. Um, and, and Coleridge as a as a poet and critic is in some ways the perfect subject for, for Seamus because he's also um, edited Matthew Arnold and William Empson. He's uh, very well known as the editor of the, the leading literary magazine, um, periodical, I should say, Essays and Criticism. 
he's working on a biography of W.H. Auden, and he knows an awful lot about modern manuscripts as well. So we're in very good company. Um, so without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who I think is going to read a passage from the book, introduce the book to us. Yeah, that's that's what it was suggested I should do. And, and like Wes, I'm actually <laughs> turning to one of the passages from the back because it gives a kind of overview. And then I'm going to read two paragraphs from inside. The two paragraphs from inside are from the first chapter entitled Dealing with the Leftovers, but from the back. So why modern manuscripts matter. This is a study of the politics, the commerce, and the aesthetics of heritage culture in the shape of author's manuscripts. Draft or working manuscripts survive in quantity from the 18th century, when with the rise of print, readers learnt to value the hand as an index of individuality and the blotted page crisscrossed by deletion and revision as a sign of genius. Since then, collectors have fought over manuscripts. Libraries have curated them. The rich have stashed them away in investment portfolios. Students have squeezed meaning from them, and we've all stared at them behind exhibition glass. Why do we trade them, conserve them, and covet them? Most, after all, are just the stuff left over after the novel or book of poetry goes into print. Poised on the boundary where precious treasure becomes abject waste, litter, and mess, modern literary manuscripts hover between riches and rubbish. And then from inside the book, handwritten literary manuscripts are special in their singularity, becoming ever more so with the shift from the written to the electronic word. To the 21st century student, more skilled at thumb texting, clicking and page swiping, the mechanical effort exacted from finger and wrist muscles in covering sheet after sheet with handwritten characters appears heroic. Handwriting's digital replacements, e-drafts, can be printed instantly and identically a hundred times from numerous different locations. These copies assuming no hierarchy and no necessary propinquity to an author. Such iterability threatens to displace altogether the interest that lies in the document for which there is now no original. By contrast, handwritten and even typed documents remain unique, unestranged from their moment and place of production, and therefore a real index of absence, their absent creator. As we leave behind the craft of pen and pencil on paper, those manuscripts we have preserved will assume unanticipated kinds of extraordinariness. Yet these survivors also denote a paradox. The literary manuscript whose content has been spent in print and publication is the remnant of a process. Left over, discarded, it occupies uncertain space. It is waste and it is not waste. As waste, it is an orphan object, dispossessed, released or adrift from any purpose, its words having moved on. Save for the curious visitor to museum, library archive, or literary house exhibition, the writer's notebook, the fair copied or messily handwritten pages, and the typed and corrected sheets realize something fresh. The residue, or maybe the essence that print cannot capture. The effort of imagination made physical in the shape of inked letters, personality or mood glimpsed or fancied in the casual or furious style of crossings out, in the pressure marks of typewriter keys left on paper, in colour of ink, in the format and quality of the paper itself. Where print makes meaning public, manuscript makes it intimate, a private compact between writer and materials that can live again in the receptive imagination. Dynamic and precious waste the deletions and substitutions of draft manuscript not only express the interior workings of text, methods and processes of composition available in no other form, they provoke reflective responses in scholar and exhibition visitor. Unrealized in print, such details have the power to infiltrate 
and enrich our understanding of the works we read and our ways of reading, offering the writer's imagination for inspection to the reader's imagination, the reader who makes her own interior life from the text. The manuscript draft is the locus for contradictory valuations, expendable as the waste the print leaves behind, it carries within it the mystery and labour that attend the will to create. The unresolved states of waste and creativity image in reverse the future that attends those few special manuscripts that traverse the spaces between pricey and priceless. Oh, thank you, Catherine. That gives us a real kind of flavour of of, of the book, the quality of the writing, but also the kind of the way Catherine thinks about manuscripts, which is so um, is so illuminating. Um, I mean, that kind of sense of the written page as a physical object is something that comes all the way through the book. And it's interesting. This is this is not just a book about manuscripts. It's also kind of work of literary criticism as well. So um, at one point when, when, when you're writing about Austen, you bring out that kind of excitement about um, the handwriting, um, and I think it, it, it's interesting, especially as you as you've just just outlined in our our current culture, where people send text messages or they write on screen and they just sort of ping things off, and there isn't that uniqueness about the written word. But you know, when when Fanny Price is is seizing Edmund's handwriting, and 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 you know we have this comment about the blessedness of handwriting yes. it's an absolutely extraordinary passage it is an extraordinary passage it? but it really you know really really comes alive and you cover things like um the autograph craze um the, the idea they become almost sort of fetishized objects don't they the, the signatures of, of, yeah. of writers in the period and it is absolutely extraordinary and yeah. and i i found um you know the stories surrounding manuscripts which come across in your book, just, just amazing, you know, you have this kind of sense of the, 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 the accidents, um, the, the accidental survivals often, and, and we get these moments of, of profound loss and vandalism, and then the excitement when something is recovered. I mean, it, it really is a very exciting read, um, which you might not guess from hearing a description of a book about, about manuscripts, but they, they really, really come to light. And there are some very, shocking sentences in it as well one of my <laughs> one of the ones sentences? that really made me me gasp was your your comment that the lost manuscripts of tom jones and pride and prejudice perhaps wrapped cheese or fish or fed the fire the idea that these manuscripts which now would be absolutely you couldn't put a price on them were just kind of routinely um you know sent off as waste paper so so that that point about manuscripts offering that kind of space between art and waste really comes alive when you you think about these priceless treasures objects just just being thrown away um and and, and it's interesting because when you're reading swift he makes jokes about his his work going to be uh, sort of furnishing the pastry cook or whatever but when you actually realize that this is what happened uh, to these manuscripts it it is very very ex extraordinary um yeah I, th I think what struck me as extraordinary that is that at some point it, it was decided to keep these things because they were just routinely thrown away. You know, they were transitional documents um, that once they had been turned into print, they were no longer needed. For instance, we don't have any manuscripts of Pride and Prejudice, of Emma, or of Persuasion, of any of the published novels, novels published in Jane Austen's lifetime. And the assumption is that Nobody valued them. They just thought, well, you know, that's finished with. We don't need them anymore. But why, at some particular point, we, we decide that we're going to keep them? And once you start keeping them, and this happens around about the middle of the 18th century, both in Britain and in France and Germany, they begin to be kept in large numbers throughout Europe in the middle of the 18th century. And once that happens, the burden of representation shifts. You begin to think differently about authors and about um, there's a kind of directly traceable originary intention of an author now. So you haven't just got print, you've got something that came before print and that you can somehow refer the author back to that. 
and you can see concepts things like genius start to emerge people talk about genius because they can see all these blots and scrapings out and changes of heart and so on and also authorial copyright starts to emerge which hadn't really existed before that it was publishers who had copyright not authors um, and all kinds of things start to emerge just because we start keep holding on to these to these manuscripts it's rather later, it's not really till the middle of the next century, the middle of the 19th century, that people start to think of them as having monetary value. And then other things become interesting, like, you know, the whole commerce, trading of manuscript. But certainly that sort of early moment is interesting. And I think one of the images I kept in my head as I was working on this book was Samuel Johnson. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a, a major man of letters in the 18th century and he produced in 1765 an edition of Shakespeare and Shakespeare of course we have no manuscripts for but already Johnson was beginning to be aware that hey, these things matter they tell you something of the psychology of an author so he talks about having an early edition of Shakespeare print and he holds the pages up to the light to try to detect the handwriting behind them which at one level is absurd, but it's also a very interesting kind of moment of, of awareness in, in how we understand uh, creativity, I think. Seamus, do you want to come in at, at this point? Well, I mean, uh, I, the first thing is to, is to echo everyone else saying what a wonderfully pleasurable read it is. It is an extraordinarily erudite book. Um, it knows an awful lot about lots of, of very different um, ar archives, lots of different writerly archives. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of knowledge um, on show in the Scott chapter alone would have been enough for most people to fill a book. Um, uh, but Catherine moves through this very particular and detailed and fine-grained erudition with great sort of grace and skill. Um, uh, and the erudition is accompanied, as, as both Wes and Fiona have been saying, by a tremendous amount of pleasure. Um, you know, there are some erudite books that I could name uh, that you finish, and you think, well, that was an erudite book, but <laughs> I can't honestly say that Howard Erskine Hill gave me much pleasure. Um, but uh, this one really does, and, and, and part of it is the style, which uh, uh, you, you've already heard a bit of, um, but part of it is the, is the way that um, the thesis of the book, the argument, the, the, you know, the governing idea of the book is in, in Catherine's own phrase that manuscripts have an, what she calls an expressive agency in their entirety as things. Um, that's what she says. So a manuscript isn't important because, or isn't just important because of the text that's written on it. It's important as an object, and as an object, it can tell you loads and loads of things about the particular kind of expressive and imaginative life of the person who created um, that manuscript. And she's brilliant at evoking that kind of human, as it were, human humanity that is embedded or encoded um, in these manuscripts that are scattered, um, you know, in, in, in research libraries uh, a, a, across the world. And I suppose the follow-up to that that I was, I was very struck by in the, in the book is something that I've been interested in for, for other reasons, um, it, which is the extraordinary variety of attitudes that authors have towards their own manuscripts. And that comes across really brilliantly in this book. So, for example, Frances Burney is such a fascinating case in this book because she is a hoarder. She can't get rid of any manuscript. This is a totally new case to me. Um, and these are, these, as I understand from, from, from your chapter, Catherine, these are very difficult to kind of slot into some kind of compositional history or, or say that this must have led to this page of this novel. They're far too complicated and odd and confusing. And it's, as though, it's as though Bernie couldn't really exist without this vast chaotic archive of herself um, surrounding, uh, uh, surrounding her you know, day to day life. And there's a wonderful discussion about what should happen to it all after her death. Um, and the answer, uh, if you're interested, is that some of it goes to New York and some of it goes to the British Library. Um, so that's one example of it. And then, uh, in a way, another extreme example that is, is a terrific um, uh, chapter about Walter Scott, who, and a brilliant evocation of Walter Scott's writing, which is just almost like automatic writing. Yeah, yeah. It's uncanny. He writes as quickly as he can speak, almost, and sends off 
the manuscripts as he's writing them to the publisher. So that, and this is, you know, I suppose a hardened Scott scholar might have tweaked this, but I've never quite realized this before, that, that um, as Catherine points out, Scott is almost never in the position of having a completed manuscript of a novel. Never. Because as soon as he's finished the first 20 or 40 pages or whatever, he sends it off to, to the printer uh, and then keeps on scribbling. And then the proofs come back and then he scribbles on the proofs. And, and so it goes through that, that sort of phase. Um, so what wonderfully divergent attitudes towards um, manuscripts. And I think what you're so good at is, is evoking, as it were, the human personalities that lie behind these, these different attitudes and the different sorts of creativity that, that, that all this all this suggests. I, I thought all that was brilliantly done. I think one of the things I was trying to do is have a more holistic approach. You know, we as scholars, and I've done it myself uh, when I'm editing, you can become obsessed with just the words. I, I remember um, a colleague and I, we were working on Jane Austen's teenage writings, and I became obsessed in the manuscripts with where Jane Austen writes out and, and where she uses an ampersand. You know, and I thought there's a whole kind of thing to do around this, the ampersand and the and. And, and indeed, I think there was something interesting. But what I'm suggesting is that as scholars, literary scholars and editors often have a very tunneled vision of a manuscript. We can be very myopic. Um, in, with another hat on, I am a trustee at Jane Austen's house. Um, and you see the reaction of museum visitors you know, real normal human beings who aren't worried about how and sound and Anne. And they come in and they look at a manuscript and they're overwhelmed by the thing. You know, they're, they're kind of sticky with presence, these manuscripts. You know, they think, you know, Jane Austen, her hand touched that. But also they're sort of looking in the round rather than just reading words. And so I wanted to try to bring together these kind of the artifactual, the social, and the linguistic aspects of manuscript to try to bring them all together and to have a more holistic understanding of what they mean. And I think especially the case, you know, when a manuscript has been, as it were, used up, when it's been turned into a printed book, you know, surely it then is released into a new kind of life that actually reading the revisions and reading the blots isn't really the most important thing about it. If we are going to preserve it, if we're going to you know, auction them, uh, if we're going to put them in vaults, in library vaults, we've got to find other ways of thinking about what they might mean. Because as I say, the words have flown. And so I'm interested in that point at which they're kind of waste paper, but they also turn into something that actually is more like an artwork. I mean, anyone who's had a look into this book will see I've got lots of really nice pictures of artworks that I actually do try to draw connections between a manuscript and a work of art. At what point might a manuscript actually become a work of art? So I, I got quite interested in that. I don't, I don't know if that's something you know, you, you've thought about and think about when you look at manuscripts in glass cases, because in a way you are looking at them in exactly the way you are looking at a painting or, or a, a sculpture, um, which is different from how a scholar will normally look at manuscripts. Um, the discussion of this in your book made me remember uh, something that happened years ago. I took a, a party of students to Grasmere, to the Wordsworth Museum, and we were shown around by the now late, alas, lovely director of the museum, a man called Robert Woof. He showed us two uh, manuscripts of Wordsworth's autobiographical poem called The Prelude. One was a very neat copy written out in um, Wordsworth's clerk's hand, and it was obviously a kind of fair copy which might have been intended to go to the printer at some time. And the other was a very messy copy in Wordsworth's own hand with some of Dorothy's you know, help, help as well. Um, but very difficult to construe, whereas the, the, the neat copy was actually very easy to read. And Robert asked my poor bewildered students, which of these manuscripts do you think is the most important or the most interesting or the most useful? Or I, don't know, I can't remember quite how he phrased the question. And lots of them thought it was this one because you can actually read it. You know, it was actually served a purpose. That, um, and Robert looked at them and frowned, you know, sort, of, sort, of, sort, of, sort of mock severity, and said, no, 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 this is the most important one, and do you know why? 
and they came up with lots of sort of bibliographical kinds of explanations. And Robert said, this manuscript has got charisma. <laughs> and I think what the Catherine's book is so good about is evoking that sense of the charisma of the charisma of manuscripts, which is more, as you say, absolutely more than just a bibliographical or, 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 te or textual thing. Mm. Yes, I mean, I think you bring out the kind of the visual within the, in in your book because of all those lovely illustrations, and mm. you you kind of look at a manuscript with all those sort of scratchings out, um, and and it's to do with knowing whose manuscript it is, though yeah. that's really important, isn't it? Because if you if you see someone you know, with all due respect to students, if it's, a, if it's an essay and it's all sort of scribbled over, you maybe don't have that kind of reverential <laughs> look at this lovely creative mess. Um, but as soon as it is William Wordsworth or Jane Austen, um, you know, immediately every single scratch and, 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 you know, revision and scribble and little doodle becomes terribly, terribly significant and yeah. something, you know, that you're kind of admiring. Um, it's just, it is very curious. Um, and I think you know you 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 make um, the whole kind of process of um, 18th and 19th century book production come come to life because when you look at sort of one of those manuscripts and you imagine the compositor you know the typesetter at the printing house um, only very pleased with certain people's manuscripts arriving because they'd be easy to read and therefore easy to set and some of them you know my goodness me what a challenge they must. Have. I must have produced and it, it would just take much longer um, so that sort of whole idea of the production of a book being a kind of team effort it's not just a question that yeah. the author has a moment of inspiration and that goes directly into the reader who's yeah. reading the printed book there's a whole That's lot right. of processes That's in between right. it's yes, a long but story isn't authors it? don't author books do mm. they no, no exactly no, no. I know students are always, my students are always amazed when, when I say to them, well, it's actually these messy things that went to the printing house. You know, they say, well, what happened to Jane Austen's fair copies? Well, chances are she didn't make them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I've, I've recently been working on George Eliot's manuscripts and uh, she's got a very neat hand, but she's constantly changing her page numbers because she's constantly adding pieces. And so just following the sequence of the pages um, is really quite extraordinary. And then she's, you know, bringing little bits and pieces in at various points. Um, and she would just hand these over in small installments to a printer and then get them back again. Um, often it's printers who paragraph. They are the ones who set out conversation. Lots of the things that we kind of assume an author did, in fact, have been attributed during the process of production. Um, so yeah, there's, there is this the kind of a whole industry goes on between an author's manuscript uh, and a book. I think one of the things I was trying to do in the book is push manuscript studies a bit further and, and think about what else we might do. Um, and one of the things that I persuaded myself of was that certain writers have certain ways of working. And that once you can discover and perhaps build an understanding of that way of working from the manuscript, you might then be able to understand rather more about the author's creative process or, or even things that stalled a, an author's creative process. I mean, I struck, for instance, that the only manuscript that survive of Jane Austen's are fragments. Um, and she is a writer who was constantly recycling. I mean, we all know this instinctively. One Jane Austen novel is pretty much like another Jane Austen novel. She recycles stories and ideas and themes and plot events, supper parties, picnics, you know, walks through the village, endlessly recycles them. You know, she's, as it were, covering the same ground over and over and over. And I was thinking, you know, that's in some ways her fragment art that survives is actually itself symbolic of, or a metaphor for how she actually works. Fanny Burney, who, whose manuscripts I actually have to say I found deeply moving, because she was a kind of, by the end, she was a mad bag lady with just these great bags. And literally she, she kept them in sugar bags, old, um, almost felt the, 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 the halfway between paper and cardboard bags that she'd stuff all kinds of notes into. 
and, and some of the bags have survived, but they're empty. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, she, she, kept, she kept word lists that you knew she'd used for one particular novel, but why on earth had she kept them? So the word list could just be random words like running, galloping, you know, several synonyms for, you know, moving fast. And you think, why has she kept this? And, and she had a, a classification system. She used a, a series of different symbols for keep to be reused, keep for conservation purposes, throw away, but interestingly, they're not thrown away. And, you know, a whole set of different symbols that she would catalogue things under. Um, and you could see there's this kind of madness to it. Um, some of her manuscripts survive in holograph, i.e. in her own handwriting, but they're discontinuous, they're just small portions. And then they'll be broken into by fair copies in her hand, uh, the hand of her husband, who also, um, he, who, who copied for her. And then they'll break off too, and, and then you'll get one thing she liked to do is she would like to, she wrote a passage, then she decided she would delete that passage. So she'd cross it through, but then she would turn it around and attach it to a blank sheet of paper and then write on the blank sheet of paper. And you think, well, why has she done that? So it would end up as a double sheet. Um, the normal thing to do would be just to cross it out and write on the back but she crosses it out and then conceals it and adds another sheet. And it's almost as though the whole thing might be sort of turned inside out again at some future time to be reused. And she, she had this idea that, and her novels are, are vast, that she would actually revise a novel in later life and rewrite the whole novel. And it, eventually she becomes so burdened by all this paper that she just grinds to a halt. And she never writes another, another word. And, and there's all this stuff. And it's just kind of, it is just a pile of litter. Um, the piles that are in the Berg Museum in New York, the Berg Library, um, are not really properly catalogued. And they are crumbling away. Um, the part that ended up in the British Library has been put inside bound albums and is really a memorial collection just of sample pieces. And clearly in the family, they, they made a decision to have a memorial collection. And then this other pile of scrap paper just hung around in, in the family for a long time. And eventually they just gave it to somebody to get rid of and it made its way to the Berg. But you just think there's something so sad about this, but it's, it is also a kind of, it's almost like it becomes a kind of representation of her life itself. Sorry, that won't tell a bit long, that, but... That, that but brings up a very... She's, it, I, find it, I still think of it, 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 it's quite moving, actually. <laughs> that, that splitting of the Bernie yeah. archive brings up another theme oh, yes. that you, you talk about, which is an, effectively a theme about public policy. You know, how should we as a society or as a, as a culture deal with these things? And you make the excellent point that if it were proposed that, let's say, the archives of the Guardian newspaper yeah. were, or the BBC were going to be split, half would go to California and half would go to the British Library, everyone would say, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. This is an archive. It has an integrity. It should all be kept together. But, you know, half of, well, two thirds of Bernie is in New York and a third is in yeah. London. And, yeah. you know, bits of Scott are in, I mean, a lot of Scott is in Edinburgh, but there are some bits in There's an awful lot in the and Morgan. So there's, there's some in Russia. Um, and, you know, you've got some very uh, interesting thoughts about, about the way that the market hasn't, hasn't actually helped much in, in, the, in the way that we preserve and curate our manuscripts as a culture. No, it hasn't. I, I, the, the market for manuscripts, i.e. manuscripts as tradable commodities uh, with a price tag, um, really takes off in the middle of the 19th century. And it's becoming very, very active by the end of the 19th century. Um, and beginning of the 20th century, what you're seeing is what Philip Larkin called the drift westward, mm -hmm. um, manuscripts moving from Britain to America. We are the only European country 
who had a former colony that's become a superpower. <laughs> and, you know, our manuscripts belong as much to America as they do to us. Um, I mean, there's a part of one that might think viscerally they should stay here and they, you know, they should stay in the soil in which they are, are, were grown, as it were. But the fact is they are American as much as they're British. They're the basis of, of American literary traditions too. Um, and there was a huge drift westwards of manuscripts throughout the 20th century. And very little attempt in Britain to hold these within the nation. Some European countries have have laws of preemption, national laws of preemption. We don't. Um, preemption, I mean that if a, a manuscript that is in private ownership comes to the market, then the nation has first right to buy it. Whereas what happens in Britain is that a manuscript is privately owned. You decide you're going to sell it because, you know, you've got to see the kids through university or you want to go off on a world cruise or whatever. So you give it to Sotheby's. It is then hiked on the international market. And it's only after it's been hiked on an international market and a potential foreign owner comes up that you can then apply under something called the Waverley criteria for a period during which an export ban can be placed on it. And then struggling national museums in Britain have to try to raise that artificially inflated price. And it just seems the wrong way to do it. Absolutely the wrong way to do it. And that's why your story about Alan Bennett deciding mm -hmm. to donate his papers to the Bodleian because he, he didn't want to end up in, in America or he didn't want to be split up all over the world. He, he was happier to be, to be, um, to be here. Um, it, it, that's yeah. responding to that that kind of thing, isn't it? Um, and one of the other things I thought was interesting, the way your book comes uh, to its conclusion with, with the very kind of contemporary story of the Honestfield collection, yeah. um, and, and um, uh, which you might want to say a bit more about for people who, who don't know about Honestfield, but this was a, a collection of a, a private collection um, that, that appeared in Yorkshire with the most amazing um, manuscript in it. And this whole argument about whether it should just be sold off mm -hmm in which case all these manuscripts go everywhere, or whether actually a collection yeah. somehow assumes a life of its own, which isn't dependent on it being all the works of a single author, um, but it actually in some ways reflects the taste of the collector. Yeah. And then these different manuscripts that have been together uh, for these reasons somehow have a kind of different entity that is different from the sum of the parts. Yeah, they have a kind of synergy, mm. don't they? Yeah, and that was extraordinary. Have, some of you might have heard of the Honrasfield Library, have you? There was a lot in the press about it. It, um, it was a library that was put together at the end of the 19th century by a man called William Law, and he was, he was a, a Lancashire mill owner. And he was collecting at exactly the same time as J.P. Morgan Sr., after whom the Morgan Library in New York is, um, is named. In fact, they were often you know, at the same auctions together. They were both collecting Walter Scott, for example. And William Law's library, called the Honrasfield Library, because that was the name of his house in Rochdale, um, this library has descended since the end of the 19th century through a collateral branch of his family. And they decided in 2021 they wanted to sell it. And it, it had already acquired amongst those of us who are interested in manuscripts a kind of mystical, mysterious sort of uh, flavour because it had been largely hidden from view. We didn't really know what was still in it, what might have been sold, what still existed there, um, because nobody had really, it was so private, no one had been allowed access to it. And it turns out that they bring it to Sotheby's uh, and the first thing Sotheby's did was take it to New York um, to put it on show. Um, and it's a library simply bursting with manuscripts. It was filled with Bronte manuscripts, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte, and manuscripts in the hands of Emily and Anne Bronte particularly, exceedingly rare. So it was full of Bronte manuscripts because William Law, the collector, had lived 20 miles from where, from the parsonage. And he probably, in fact, even, he would have been a teenager when Charlotte died. He probably knew her, at least by sight. It had Walter Scott manuscripts in, the manuscript of his novel, Rob Roy. 
huge amounts of Walter Scott letters. It had Jane Austen letters, Byron letters, Burns poetry, something known as Burns' first commonplace book, which again is a fabled collection. Oh, and the absolute Sotheby's um, put a price tag of two million pounds on a 31 page manuscript of poems in Emily Bronte's tiny, tiny hand. So this suddenly appeared on the market and it was going to be broken up at sale. Uh, but uh, we got together a consortium um, of, li of libraries and literary houses under the umbrella of Friends of the National Libraries, which was set up in the 1930s, in fact, to try to save national British heritage. And we raised 15 million pounds, which was the price Sotheby's put on this library, 15 million pounds in six months. And so that it's that sort of daily mirror headline, saved for the nation, you know. Um, and, and now these manuscripts are a distributed collection, but distributed around Britain. So the Bronte manuscripts have gone to Bronte Parsonage, the Walter Scott manuscripts have gone to Walter Scott's house in Abbotsford, um, and also to the National Library of Scotland. Burns has gone to Alloway, his birthplace, kind of honouring the idea that somehow these manuscripts belong in a particular place, in a, perhaps a scene of writing. So kind of romantic notion, but, um, but you know, quite often that doesn't happen. At the moment, Jane Austen manuscripts are coming on the market fairly regularly. And by manuscripts, I mean of her letters, um, not, not of novels. And they're more likely to go to um, the East, to China, than they are to go to anywhere else. And owners have a right. I mean, these are just private property, like, like owning a bicycle or a car. You can do what you like with it. Um, and they have a right to sell and to sell to the highest bidder. But there is a kind of anxiety that once it, say, goes to China, it will disappear into a private collection and perhaps never be seen again. And there is, I think there is something emotive about these things. We do feel that they belong in particular places, whether rightly or wrongly. Um, so over the years, some, some people have tried to come up with um, notions of how we might represent the fact that the public feels certain items in private ownership somehow belong to all of us. Because mm -hmm. um, it's a very complicated notion. I mean, you know, if you own a bicycle, I might covet it, but I can't possibly believe it belongs to me. But a manuscript is rather different because to some extent, public esteem raises its value, even though it's in your ownership. So in some sense, I have contributed to its value. How do you, how do you recognize that? Um, and it is something that, you know, some of us think about, but there is nothing in legislation at all, other than these temporary export bars where we desperately attempt to, to raise funds. Um, funds that, you know, artificial prices really, loony prices often. I wonder at this point whether um, anyone has a question um, from our audience. Everybody's been so wrapped by what you've been talking about um, with good reason. So I wonder if, stunned. If, people, if people have questions. I think often it's a practical thing. I mean, clearly, Frances Burney, this bag lady, um, she did believe that she could renew copyright in her books if she kept her manuscripts and then actually revised them very considerably so that she could then renew copyright. And she was worried for the future of her son after she died because he wasn't very good at earning a living. So she thought, well, if I keep all this stuff, so it's purely practical. Um, it was a purely practical reason. Walter Scott, he is really curious because um, he gifted his manuscripts to his friends and then was outraged that they still didn't belong to him. Um, uh, and 
since his works were already in copyright, the works that the manuscripts represented, the manuscripts didn't really have any legal status or any real value. Um, and this was before as well, before they had acquired value in the auction houses. So he had a very odd, it was almost as though he felt they were like his limbs. Yeah. It really did, a very, very curious attitude to them, especially from an author, as Seamus was saying, who um, involved the social production of, of novels, of his works, quite early on. So he wasn't, he didn't mystify the processes of production. In some ways, he was very happy for, for you know, printers, compositors, for, for um, the whole mechanics to take over very early on and make lots of decisions about the work. But then when he came to these manuscripts, he got very... Um, so, so those are two examples. I mean, in, I don't know that you can, though, divide male and female in that particular way. I think some writers have particular attitudes. Nowadays, of course, um, your manuscripts could be your pension. Um, you know, many writers, they're freelancers. They, they have, lead very precarious lives. You know, we think of it as a glamorous profession, but even people who end up on bestseller lists don't necessarily make huge amounts of money. So your, your manuscript sold in the right way um, will be your pension. Um, and that's often why they go off to the highest bidder. That's often as well why they're, they're divided up um, because some parts are assumed to have more value than others. Um, I, one of the writers I'm particularly interested in is Muriel Spark, and um, she sold lots of her manuscripts quite early on to American collections, and they're all over the place. And then other stuff that she thought had less value, she just had it all boxed up by, by the friend she lived with, and it's gradually making its way to the National Library of Scotland. Um, and that's a curious archive because lots of the stuff she kept, she kept all her hairdresser's bills, for instance. But it's also interesting to think about, you know, manuscripts in the future, isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. now people are just kind of composing at a keyboard. Yeah. What, what counts yeah. as a manuscript? What will count as a manuscript? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, um, Notorious examples, aren't there, of, of, of literary estates. So in the Joyce estate, of course, is, is a, a particularly famous one where, where, where family do feel that they, you know, they have a hand that can control into the future. Um, what do I think about it? Well, it is law. It is possible to do that. Some of Keats's friends were trying to control how the material was represented in print and Shelley's family of course were, were certainly doing the same so certainly it's beginning in the 19th century beginning with those romantic writers who you could argue are right at the beginning aren't they of of of, of the preservation the conservation of of of, of their handwriting um, so it's emerging quite early I guess I guess it is but you really see it sort of solidifying for the, the generation after them, as it were, in the 1890s, I guess, is, is when you see it. And of course, it's, it became very important with, um, with, with certain writers in the, in the 20th century. Um, so, some estates are, are more flexible than others. But of course, one of the things you have to do, which might surprise you, if you're working on manuscripts anyway, is that manuscripts tend to be owned. And if a manuscript has never been printed, then its copyright is still owned by somebody. So it is possible that there could be, you know, a fragment of John Donne that you have no right whatsoever to publish unless you get the permission of the owner of the, of the estate. And you think, hey, but wait a minute, that's here 400 years ago. Um, so in law, um, that kind of estate business is... is, is is really quite tricky and, and it, it is long lasting. Well, I think curiosity is a great word actually because curiosity is, is something I was thinking about a lot. What is curiosity? Um, and it's a distributed condition, isn't it? Curiosity as much as anything. I mean, it signifies both 
the mental state of the observer, you know, I am curious about this, and its kind of properties within the thing itself, we think this is curious. And at a certain point, you know, that, that emerges as an idea, curiosity. And it is very, very powerful. It's powerful through the 18th century. It, it's, it's there when, when you start, start having the, um, I mean, um, the, the, um, the inception of, of the public museum and curiosity for all of us, but then, you know, the objects of curiosity um, much earlier than that too. But one of the things that I was thinking about is, is how do you understand curiosity in terms of shifting the waste paper of the manuscript towards an artwork? And that's why I turned at several points in my book actually to Cornelia Parker, whose work fascinates me. I absolutely love what she, what she does. But she works often with found objects and reclaimed objects. And it seems to me that's what many of us are doing when we're looking at objects in or manuscripts in exhibitions. We're thinking about them in those same terms. And she, she sort of refashions them. She re-engineers them. And I think that is what we do too with these remains, with these manuscript remains. We, we re-engineer them. The French word remembrement, you know, when you're when you're gathering together people in villages. I know this because I live part of the time in France, and the, because of the, the the system of inheritance in France, you can end up owning tiny bits of land in all over your village. You know, I mean, often it's it's no bigger than that, <laughs> and at various points there are remembrement when you bring together these scattered bits. And, you know, then you decide amongst yourself, you know, I will have that bigger bit and you can have this bit. And I think that's often what we're doing with these manuscripts and remains is that we are, as Cornelia Parker is doing as well with, with her artworks, we are, you know, refashioning them and putting together in particular ways. And I think we're going to have to do that more and more inventively, actually. I think, you know, our, our libraries, our museums are stashed with this stuff. We all own, and much of it is owned by us. We want to see it, we have a right to see it. And I think we do need to display it more imaginatively, because if we do, um, people will be curious. Well, I think um, that's a perfect note to, <laughs> to finish on. And I think, I think your book is going to be really important in that, in that movement, actually. So, um, If only OUP can get it to read them. <laughs> which is a serious, serious problem at the moment. OUP do not market books anymore. I would never, if I had my time over again and this came out a year ago, I would not, I would not give it to OUP. I want that to be on record. What have you done with the manuscript? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think mine matter. <laughs> Good. Well, on that very feisty note, I think we should thank Catherine. Thank you very much.